I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was in the agency for, well, you know, again, I'm going on two decades, I don't ever remember having a political discussion. We never sat in a safe house. And you could spend a lot of time sitting in a safe house waiting for something to pop, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever reason, you know, the target's not available or you're waiting for headquarters to say, yeah, let's do it. We never had conversations sitting around talking politics. It just wasn't a thing, mm-hmm. right? And the agency itself is is always supposed to be apolitical. I mean, it's human, right? So people are going to have their opinions and that's fine. You know, but, you know, you keep it in check, right? Sure. Um, and so obviously the rub now is that that's not the case, right? Both for the agency and the Bureau. The Bureau's taking a real kicking. Joining me today is a former CIA officer, a security expert, and host of the President's Daily Brief podcast, Mike Baker. Finally, Thanks. welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate I, it. I'm glad to have you for a couple of reasons. I see you on Rogan. I see you on Gutfeld, all, all the usual places. The podcast is great. Uh, but you're kind of doing me a favor by being here today, too, because I've been doing a lot of racehorse politics, a oh. lot of primary, <laughs> oh, God. who's going to win, battle it yeah. out, all of that stuff. And I'm actually really looking forward to taking a little bit of a break from that and talking yeah. mostly about war. Yeah. Oh, that, oh, good. Does, does yeah. Sound, uh, we'll lighten it up a little bit. The several impending wars that <laughs> that's are. Right. That's right. <laughs> that the world's coming. on fire. So let's uh, cheer people up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you tell people just briefly before we dive into all that? Because sure. I, I normally don't even keep notes in front of me, but I was like, there's a lot of places on this planet that are aflame right now. And I want to make sure we don't miss any of them. Yeah, it's but, exactly right. But before we get to any of that, can you just give people a little more of your background for someone that, that may not know who you are? And then we'll, and then we'll dive in. Sure. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I just, was with the agency, the CIA, for uh, about 20 years, going on 20 years. And I was in what they call the Directorate of Operations. So the agency is broken up into different segments, right? You have operations, you have the Directorate of Intelligence. They change the names occasionally, but basically it's always the same four groups. And the Intel Directorate, that's where all the smart people are, and they write the reports. They take all the intelligence. They take everything that's coming in, right? And you have the really smart writers, the analysts, all those people. And then they have a uh, a, a, an admin, essentially, section that does all the logistics, and they really keep the place running. Because uh, it's it's not like just admin for, say, a company that's making widgets, right? <laughs> you're you're running Intel operations around the world, mm-hmm. so it's a it's a bit of a different game. And then there's the science and technology group, and they make all the amazing gadgets, right? So think about, um, well. I can I just spit on a rabbit hole on that one. <laughs> Battery tech. Are, are you wearing any of those things? I, I, at the I, I, I am, I as a matter of fact. I never travel you. without a couple of gadgets. Yeah, right, uh, right. But they, uh, you know, everything from spy satellites to the U2 program, uh, battery technology. If anybody's walking around with a defibrillator, right, it, they can thank the agency because they, they led the way in terms of miniaturization, right, because mm-hmm. you needed small batteries for operational reasons, right? Uh, but I was in the director of operations and spent all my time overseas, which was great. Um, had a wonderful time. Got out, started a, a private sector company that does um, uh, basically intelligence and security, risk mitigation. And it's Portman Square Group. And we're now... I take it that's probably going pretty well these days. It's gone the well, yeah. things happening in the world. I think, you know, it sounds mercenary, but we do well when there's a little bit of chaos. Um, and we... Most of our work is, is, is overseas. You know, we do, we do a fair amount in the States, but the majority is overseas. And we've got offices of, uh, in a number of places. Uh, great people. It's been a wonderful experience because I had no business experience at all. None. And so when it came time to get out of the agency, because I was raising my daughter, um, I had to do something. Right? And I didn't really have a lot of skills. So I thought, well, I'll stay in what I know. And it worked out. I started it with a, a, a wonderful friend of mine who came from the British teams. And uh, we just got really lucky. And we met wonderful people. And we, best thing we did was we hired smart people, right? And then we gave them the, the objective. And then we set them on their way, right? And that was, that's, uh, uh, there's a, a few things I learned from the agency. And one of them was, was essentially that, right? Bring on the best people you can. Tell them what the mission is and then have the confidence that they're going to get on with it. Right. And now if things go south, OK, then you got to step in and, and help out. But so we've been fortunate. We've done that. And then I, I got involved in some some TV work and, and some film work. Um, the podcast has been great. We mm-hmm. just started that in September. The president's daily brief. 
whole new experience. I give you a, a tremendous amount of credit because it's it's not easy. Right? It's a lot of gadgets, mostly hairspray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. But I'm going through an awful lot of glitter yeah. and lip balm. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's it's uh, it's an audio podcast right now. They they're turning it into a into a video podcast. Um, but it's it's a lot of work. So I you know I take my hat off to you. But uh, it's been fun. So let me ask you a little bit more about uh, the agencies in general, because I've mm. talked to a couple of CIA guys, obviously, FBI, et cetera. And I always find it interesting when you when you talk to some of these guys who are out in terms of how much they can talk about and mm. how they can take the stuff that they learned and apply it to either new businesses or just kind of what's going on in the world without without breaking protocol, without right. revealing secrets, et cetera. How do you how do you balance all that stuff? Well, you know what? Um, you have to be smart enough to know what you're not supposed to say, right? And then you have to be disciplined enough not to, to open your yap and, and, and do that. So sources and methods you never talk about. I've got a very good relationship with the agency, I think in part because they, they know I respect them. I had a great time, right? I'm not one of those people who left and, and, and talks bad about because right. I had I just had a great time. I was lucky in that sense, right? And had worked for amazing people and and worked with people that were tremendous. Um, and so as long as you understand what you are not supposed to say, right? And you sign secrecy agreements, and those secrecy they, they don't have a, a shelf life, right? You know, it's not as if okay, it's ten years on now. I can <laughs> I right. can now yeah, go on yeah. TV and you, you take that list out yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. You, you, so you take that to your grave, and you need to respect that. Right. Um, so, and the agency, they, they were very good to me, right. When I left, because, you know, the, their point was, well, don't leave. You know, at first it was, it was sort of like, don't leave. Cause what else are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, look at you. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, they meant in a kind way, you sure. know? And then when I did go to leave, they said to the degree that we can, you should leave and be able to say that you were here. Right. And so that's a process in itself. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realize the value of that at the time because I didn't, you know, again, no business experience. So getting out um, and being able to do that, that opened some doors that I hadn't really anticipated. And so that was a, a very good thing. How different do you think the agency is now, the CIA specifically, from when you were involved? Because my guess is 20 years ago, there was a, I don't want to speak for you, but there right. was probably a certain level of trust in the institution that now, at least from the outside, seems, seems let's say, shaky at best. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. And that's a real, yeah, that, that's a real problem. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was in the agency for, well, you know, again, going on two decades, I don't ever remember having a political discussion. We never sat in a safe house. And you could spend a lot of time sitting in the safe house waiting for something to pop, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, you know, the target's not available or... You're waiting for headquarters to say, yeah, let's do it. We never had conversations sitting around talking politics. It just wasn't a thing, mm -hmm. right? And the agency itself is, is always supposed to be apolitical. I mean, it's human, right? So people are going to have their opinions, and that's fine. Yeah. But, you know, you keep it in check, right? Sure. Um, and so obviously the rub now is that that's not the case, right? Both for the agency and the Bureau. The Bureau's taking a real kicking. Yeah. And... And I think that's a real shame because everybody I know, including at the Bureau, um, and these are operators, right? These are the agents at the Bureau. These are the officers at the, at the uh, CIA. They're, just, they're terrific, right? And they're not political. And they, and they just do what they're supposed mm -hmm. to do. Right? And the agency's job is very simple, right? You protect the, the interests of the, national, uh, of, of, of the nation, you know, national security concerns. And... The administration tells you what are your priorities, uh, whichever administration's in charge, and then you just march on and do it. Mm -hmm. right? But obviously the rub is now it's become a political organization. I would argue the same thing that's been argued about the Bureau, which is that takes place at a much higher level, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, the director, uh, that's a political position, essentially, appointed by the president. And... Yeah, you can get a director who's you, who's too enamored with politics, with too enamored with being at the White House, too enamored with that you know the tightness of, of that relationship and, and what it means. Uh, you can get others too who are you know more senior. But I can't speak for now, but I can speak for when I was there. Yeah, it wasn't a, a political organization, and you understood that because 
we spent our time in some real shitholes overseas, right? In some very difficult environments where the tradition was if the government was overthrown and they seem to be getting overthrown a lot, <laughs> then next thing you know, they'd just sweep out the military, they'd sweep out the intel organization, whatever the organization they had, and they'd install their buddies, their friends, those that they knew were be rock solid loyal. And you see how awful that was mm-hmm. and what it would mean to the, that, that particular country. And so, you know, you had a real understanding that that was never to happen with the agency. So, yeah, I think we have to always be on guard about that. But the best way to to guard against it, unfortunately, is to have a very uh, proactive and curious and demanding um, oversight by the uh, intel committees up on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately because... (laughs) My theory is we really don't send our best and brightest right. to Capitol Hill. Right. So there's a couple of prong problem here. It's yeah. sort of politics have been injected into the agencies and then the oversight committees, obviously the congressional oversight committees, as you said, these are not yeah. the best and the brightest. Yeah. So do you think there's anything that can be done to bring some of that trust back? I mean, especially on the Republican side now, yeah. you're hearing candidates say, you know, just blow away the agencies oh, altogether and, and yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. When but you like, hear that, what, what, yeah. Would, what would look at like a sort of sane reformation? as these things have become political. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear that talk when people say, we got to fire them all. You know, whether they're talking about the agency or they're talking about the FBI or whatever. Yeah. Or just shut it down. You think, you know, look, okay, you're obviously too stupid, right, to represent anybody. You know, how did you possibly get up on Capitol Hill? No, look, there's some very bright people. I know a couple of the people on the on the intel committees that are super smart. One of them from, from Idaho, uh, Senator Risch, right? They're some very good people. But we also have some morons, right? So I don't want to paint them all with the same brush. But um, I think what would a what would a logical step be? I think one of the things that needs to be done is that the after nine eleven they created uh, you know uh, the DNI position, right? Mm-hmm. And they they basically collapsed everything into one organization from the intel community, right? All the various intel agencies. And the CIA director was kind of pushed to the side, right? In favor of the DNI, who then, you know, sort of had that job of sitting in the White House more. It's important to have a better line of communication between the director of the agency and the Oval Office, right? Now, you know, you can well make the argument that it just depends on the president, right? Because some presidents are better at, at that relationship. They pay sure. more attention. You know, there was always the rub on, on Trump that he didn't read uh, the uh, the briefings that came in. Um, others read every page, right? It just depends on the person. But I guess my point is, I think one of the problems we've got is is we don't have a, a better line of communication between the agency directly and and the Oval Office. It's too important an organization, particularly in today's times, mm-hmm. um, to relegate it to just a member of the intel community. Um, otherwise, I think that you've got to have better vetting of the senior leadership, right, in terms of when they're appointed, right? And that, again, is job of the intel committees, mm-hmm. the Congress mm-hmm. and Senate. And then, like I said, once you get below that senior level, people are just doing their job. They yeah. honest to God, don't give a shit who's in charge. Just, you know, on the professional level, sure. just tell us what the hell the mission is. Do you, do you have any sense of how much DEI has infected that level? That The level that you're well, saying is pretty solid? Because yeah, yeah. my guess is that would be the level that would get hit it's, the hardest. It's been hit, yes. And, and it's there. Right. They've they've done what everybody else has done. Right. They played the game of of DEI. And um, I've seen a couple of the recruiting ads that they've run. Um, Look, uh, the agency was an old boy network. Right. Kind of the original days after World War Two. It was very much like a Yaley operation. Right. Ivy Leagues and somebody get a tap on the shoulder and then be recruited. And yes, you've got a very homogenous looking group, you know. so, but from an operational perspective, you want a real mix, right? Mm-hmm. So rather than being told that we're doing this because it, you know, makes the world a better place from a DEI perspective, I'd rather see the director instruct everyone saying, 
we operate all around the globe. Sure. And we better blend in, right? In this case, there are reasons there that you are would want people of different colors and different solid, languages. Exactly, and, and, exactly. And, exactly. It's a perfect yeah. reason. You don't have to play the DEI game because you need to have that right. operational, you know, diversity. And and so, you know, to me, you know, having a, an equity officer or a DEI, you know, director or whatever is, is it's just bullshit. It's nonsense, right? Just do your job, which is get out there and hire the best and brightest to operate around the globe, right? And yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, you raise an interesting point with it. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.